Hello, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here at GoSum. I'm honored to be here and honored to get the chance to talk with you about some of the stuff that I'm doing and am interested in doing in the space of Rust and education. Uh, some talk needs to be the least technical talk. I think this will be that one in this track, but hopefully there will be things here that everyone can enjoy and appreciate. Uh, so if you are newer to Rust, maybe you'll learn some things about how to learn Rust. If you're like most of the people here, I think, more experienced in Rust, maybe you'll learn some things today about how to teach uh, Rust and how to help other people learn. And that's definitely the goal. Um, yeah, I'm Bart Massey. I'm from Portland State University in the United States where I've been a professor for 20 some years. And I've been an open source person for a long time. What I want to talk to you today is about something that some of the other speakers have also talked about a lot, which is this idea that Rust is hard to learn. Uh, and it's an idea that's very much floating around in the community. It scares people away from Rust. It makes it intimidating to people who start. And I am going to echo what several of the other speakers have already said. I don't think Rust is that hard to learn anymore. I think it's getting to be easy. And I want to talk about a particular reason why it's getting to be easy. And that reason is that we have many, many resources now to help you learn Rust. It's a thing that's a big change in the last few years is that an explosion of ways to learn the language. And so I want to talk with you about that a little bit. And I want to talk with you about it partly because as a university professor, I think universities play a key role in the adoption of new languages. I think it's very important to have the universities on board and engaged. And so I'm trying to bring Rust to universities. And I think this is also an industry thing. The things that are good for universities also tend to be good for industry. And I think by doing this, we can have a better playing field to work together. So that's where I'm coming from today. That's my plan. Uh, let me get out a clock and make sure I'm on schedule here. Um, so I've been learning programming and programming languages for a long time. Uh, it's something I've done since I was a kid during the microcomputer revolution in the 1970s. And I've been teaching programming for almost as long. Uh, it's something I really enjoy. For the last five years, I've taught Rust programming in particular to many students, uh, about nine offerings, about 400 students of uh, my Rust course. And so I have opinions. And some of what you're going to hear today, I think, is as much opinion as fact. So that's one caveat. Another one is that I will talk today mostly about Western education. I don't know as much about how things are done other places. Please forgive my ignorance for that. And the third thing, and this is really one of, part of the message of the talk, the third thing is that things are moving very fast right now. And anything I tell you right now may, in another few weeks, be out of date. So please forgive that as well. So I'm the founder and, I guess, director of something called Rust Edu. The idea of Rust Edu, which was very generously funded by Future Way in 2022, thank you very much, Future Way, for that support, is to get Rust curriculum set up for universities, to develop and promote tools and services for Rust education, to improve the learnability of the Rust programming language itself, in general, to 
make Rust more learnable, but especially to get Rust into university curricula. Now, I should start with something I should have said at the beginning. This is a bit of a bait and switch. The talk listed on the printed program is actually the talk that I will give later in the week at the Rust Conf, uh, at the GoSim Conf, sorry, in the Rust track, about um, getting Rust into universities. This is the primary mission of Rust Edu, but what I want to talk about today is this business of learning Rust and Rust learnability. If you're interested in Rust Edu, by the way, the URLs are there, um, both for the organization and for the Zulip chat that we use to communicate. You're all more than invited to join that. So let's talk about learning Rust is hard. Learning Rust is hard is one of those things that float around. I feel like it's less and less true, and I feel like the people around me feel that it's less and less true, but there are some real big barriers in Rust. There's some things that other languages don't fight quite so hard. Rust is a big language. It's really quite big, and all of it is used. There are other languages that are bigger, for sure, but people tend to use small subsets of, smaller subsets of those big languages. Um, C++, for example, almost no one uses all of C++ on any project. It's just bigger than that. But in Rust, we tend to use most of the language in our projects. Uh, we have this new concept, the part that everybody thinks is the hard part, which is this idea of compiler-driven memory management, where the compiler takes care of where the memory is and stuff. And that's a new thing to learn, and new concepts always make learning a language harder. There's also a bunch of concepts that aren't new to Rust, but I think are new to many learners of Rust. Many of the people learning the language uh, sort of have to engage with these topics, and it can be a struggle. Uh, functional programming is a big deal. Rust supports a functional style. Rust encourages a functional style. And yet, if you don't have any background in functional programming, learning to read and write that style is a bit challenging. Uh, we have a fairly fancy type system. Uh, it's fancy in a different way than template types in uh, C++, but it's in some ways a more sophisticated and harder to learn type system with all kinds of nuances. Uh, we have a very nice module system which has a learning curve. When I teach students Rust, they struggle a lot of times with the difference between a crate and a module and with module scope and how you actually manipulate module namespaces, and that's, so that's a challenge for Rust that um, the languages they'd had previously doesn't, don't always have. Just the simple things. Modern text and strings are terrifying to most of my students. Uh, they really barely understand Unicode. They really don't understand the higher level stuff built on top of that, and the fact that with Rust, you can't just gloss over it. It isn't Python where you can pretend strings are ASCII when you're starting out. Here you're confronted, you're, on day one, here it is, you need to understand how strings work, and that's actually a surprisingly large barrier. I've changed in my classes from teaching strings fairly late to teaching them very early, and I'm always surprised how challenging it is. And it just goes on. There's a bunch of these topics that I didn't list that I'm sure you could, where, yeah, you could have got them elsewhere, you probably should have got them elsewhere, but you didn't get them elsewhere, and now you have to engage with that, all while engaging with this new language and with the borrow checker. Um, the last thing that makes learning Rust hard, I think, and again, this is something other speakers have said, and I totally agree with them, is that Rust sort of strongly encourages what we'll call good data design, good as a matter of opinion, but certainly Rust encourages a particular kind of data 
representation. And if you don't use that kind of data representation, then it's very hard to write good Rust, to write Rust programs that work well. Um, similarly, Rust encourages, there again, good, I would argue, programming. It, if you write weird code that isn't sort of suited to the purpose, the compiler is likely to reject it rather than letting you kind of have weird cases and stuff. And that challenge is big. And again, if you came in with good data design skills and good programming skills, this isn't so much of a barrier, but most people don't. Most people come in from languages where they didn't have to learn that much discipline around these things. Uh, but as an old man, I'm entitled to talk about the past and shake my fist at clouds and generally be silly. I learned C around 1985 when it was a newish language and was considered a hard language to learn. People believed it was hard. I, maybe it was true. I don't know. Um, what were the barriers in C? Well, it's a big language by the standards of the day. It seems small now, but I promise you in 1985, it did not seem small. Uh, all of it's used. We have this new concept, which wasn't really a thing before C, of manual memory management where you had to call malloc to get memory and free to get rid of it. That wasn't really a thing. Previous languages were reference counted or garbage collected or didn't have any memory management facilities at all. And so we had to learn how to use malloc and free properly, how to manage, mess with a heap. And there were these concepts that weren't new to C, but were new to many learners of C. Pointers were new, memory accesses, the whole idea of you know, understanding how the machine's memory worked was an assembly language programmer thing before C for the most part. Uh, static types were new to a lot of people. Um, if you came from the basic world, um, not so much. Uh, separate compilation. I, so what I did is I asked a bunch of my friends who are from this era, you know, what did you find hard about learning C? And one of them had the story that, well, <laughs> I learned C by writing a C compiler for in, in assembly code. And I'm like, okay, forget you. <laughs> but of the rest, one of the things that I got several times was this whole idea of linking, you know, compi separate compilation and linking modules together and how externs worked and that kind of stuff was kind of a new thing with, you know, to a lot of people with C. Not to everybody, but to a lot of people with C. Um, the C preprocessor, people had never used a language with a macro preprocessor before. That was a new thing to learn for a lot of people. Um, so we had the same problem. We had the, the 1985 version of the Rust is hard problem is my argument. Whoops. And, oh right, okay. so. What did we have for resources? How did we possibly learn C given all these things? Well, we had the C programming language. If you have learned C without reading the C programming language, go fix that now. It is perhaps the greatest book on, prog on a programming language ever written. It's absolutely beautiful and a must read. We had sort of the documentation for our tools. You know, I learned with Johnson PCC, it's easy to forget how primitive the portable C compiler was, but we had it and we had documentation for it. We had doc some Unix tools and we had document, like make, we had documentation for those. We had some very early forums, Usenet, maybe BBSs at that point, um, not a lot, but there were places we could ask questions, sort of. And we had friends. I learned so much from the friends around me. I was mentored by so many people. And I mentored some people in turn. And there was just a lot of let's learn this thing together that really mattered. The result, we learned C. All my friends at my university and I figured out C pretty well. It was doable. Sure, it was a small language compared to Rust, but partly we just stuck with it and we're not intimidated by the fact that there were parts of it that were hard, and we figured them out. 
We didn't have any classes. This wasn't something I learned in school. I literally had no computer science classes as an undergraduate. It was just this other stuff. But what we did have at my institution is access to hardware and software to run C programs. And it turned out to be enough. So like I say, right now I'm teaching Rust in university. I'm teaching a full survey course on Rust. We go through the whole Blandy and Orendorf uh, programming Rust book from start to finish in 10 weeks, which means that it's very much a survey course because that's a big book and covers all of Rust. Um, I did not start teaching Rust until there were enough resources out there to help me teach. In particular, when um, Jim and Jason came out with their book, I said, this is the textbook I can use for a Rust class. I really wouldn't have started without that. But there's also was a ton of support material by that point. This was five years ago. And that was what convinced me I could teach this as a university class and succeed. The more the resources have come, the easier it is to teach Rust, and the more instruction that's getting done. And so to some extent, Rust education resources gate the teaching and learning of Rust. Uh, when those things are available, it gives room for everything else to happen. And of course, like I say, I didn't learn C at university. Most people today are still learning Rust on their own. And these resources, of course, are vital to people who want to learn Rust on their own. So let's talk a little bit about learning resources. Um, and what I'm going to do is hopefully a really quick uh, survey of what, what learning resources are available in Rust. But I don't have time to talk about everything. The amount of resources is just immense now. And so what I'm going to concentrate on is resources that are focused on people learning Rust uh, for the first time. Uh, the more advanced and applied stuff is absolutely full of cool things. I've taught, I co-taught this summer a uh, web front-end and back-end course, mostly back-end, and I co-taught an um, embedded course. I'm, I taught a game design course that will probably have a Rust component in the future. Um, graphics, all these things, games, graphics, whatever, have good Rust resources, but we don't have time to talk about those today. So let's talk about just Rust learning resources, and let's start with courses. Uh, Hank down there hiding in the front row is one of the people participating in something called Rust 101, which is a free-to-use on GitHub uh, set of course materials for teaching a full Rust course. Uh, I haven't dove as fully into it as I should, but what I've seen is awesome. And the availability of this is really, really going to matter. You are encouraged, by the way, to look over those materials, use them, and contribute pull requests to, to, to help improve those materials. Uh, Rust Edu is, as of hopefully today, a partial sponsor of this, and I think it's a great effort. Um, Martin Geisler at Google's uh, Comprehensive Rust is a three-day short course aimed at industry more than academia, but the idea is to take experienced professionals and teach them enough Rust to get started very, very quickly. Absolutely amazing. I myself am working on publishing a bunch of my course content at Rust Edu. It's, again, going slower than I like. The point is there's courses out there. If you want to go the course route, that's a thing we can do for you and with you. And that's new. I mean, really, that's new in the past couple of years. Before that, there just wasn't much out there as far as pre-prepared course content. Now there is starting to be. We can always use more, by the way. So please talk to us at Rust Edu if you have some idea or plan for that. There's the Rust programming language. It's the book. Um, on the web. It's a free online official Rust book by the Rust Project, and it tries to be the C programming of Rust, language of Rust, which is a big ask. That is just hard. Um, it does a good job, I think, in some ways. Uh, Rust is big, and so some things right now are maybe 
less well covered than they could be. There's room for improvement there. Some REST features are just new and hard to understand. Uh, async in particular is very difficult to explain to a new REST programmer, and so the book sometimes struggles with that. And as REST changes, it takes time for the book to catch up. Having said all those things, it's an amazing book, and I highly recommend that anyone who hasn't looked at it somehow in this room uh, go look at it. And I highly recommend that you encourage people starting out to start there as much as any place. It is definitely the strongest starting point in a lot of ways. Um, there's been some forks of it. Uh, the Will Crichton and his colleagues at Brown have done a thing where they've worked on re updating the reference and, and borrowing chapter. This is very new work. Um, I would encourage you to check that out. I think it's a big, a big improvement in explaining that sometimes difficult topic. So, yeah, that. I am a big fan of programming Rust. We'll start with the disclaimer at the bottom. Jim Blandy, who is the principal author of this book, is a friend of mine, and so take what I say with a grain of salt. But I used it as a course textbook and would have used it even if I'd never met Jim just because it is the complete, comprehensive, clear book of Rust for people who already have some systems programming background. Um, it's super complete, it's super thorough, there's lots of examples, it's very professionally edited and maintained. Um, can't say enough positive about this book. This is the second thing I point people at after PRPL. There's a lot of Rust books now. Again, this is brand new. A few years ago, there weren't a lot of Rust books. There were a few Rust books. Now there's quite a lot of Rust books. There's about five that I've read and can recommend. Um, you know, as I was going through Amazon preparing for the talk, I was like, well, what's out there now? And there's, there's a bunch of good books. And there's a bunch that look good, but I haven't had a chance at yet. And then there's another 30 that honestly look kind of like cash grabs. I've grabbed a few books that are kind of like cash grabs, and what I mean by that is they're not edited well at all, the writing is a little sketchy in spots, um, it's not clear that everything that's in them is, you know, quite correct. I don't take that as a bad thing. I mean, it's a problem in that you want to avoid those when you're recommending books to people, but what it means is that we're at that phase in Rust where people are excited enough that it's worth writing a book on Rust to try to cash in. That wasn't true <laughs> three years ago, and so it's really cool to see it happen. Um, about 30 of those 50 are applied REST books. Um, they're great. Uh, my favorites from the list that I was leafing through are just to pick a couple random ones. Uh, REST for Rustations is the best intermediate REST book I know of. Highly recommended. Um, Begin Rust by the Snoymans is really interesting. It's Rust as a first programming language course for people who've never programmed before. Um, there again, three years ago, if when people would ask on forums or whatever, should I start learning to program in Rust? The answer was always no, no, be Python. You need to be Python. Um, I'm starting to see cracks in that wall. And that, again, is an interesting sign to me that maybe Rust is getting easier to learn, is that people are seriously trying out the idea of maybe Rust should be your first programming language. Am I there yet? I don't know. But I don't think it's crazy. I think it's just a thing we'd have to figure out, and that's new. That's very new. There's Rustlings. Ah, Rustlings. It's... If you haven't seen it, it's a large collection of curated exercises for beginning Rust programmers. It's aimed very much at learning Rust. It isn't general exercises. And it has some small tools for helping with the process of using the exercise. There's lots of people using it. There's lots of people helping to make it better. It is a thing. And I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't. It's not for everybody. I'm not honestly sure if it's for me, even though I've done the whole thing. But it is, a lot of people have found it really, really helpful. Um, JetBrains, interestingly, 
someone at JetBrains did a really nice adapted version of this idea integrated with the JetBrains IDE tools. Uh, that thing is cool. I'm not an IDE person, so I've only done a little bit of it, but it's really, really cool. We have lots of, there's this whole culture for a long time now on the web of sort of general purpose programming exercises, programming, you know, here's some, a programming problem that you can try to solve. And most of those sites these days are multi-language, very, very multi-language. They support 20, 30, 40 languages. And one of them is, of course, Rust now. It's a little different experience. Some of the ex exercises don't adapt so well. And certainly the exercises don't tend to bring out teaching Rust-specific concepts. But it is a really great way to practice uh, you know, your Rust um, is to pick that up. I like the Exorcism Rust track in particular. I've contributed a bit to it. I've finished most of it just to see how it ran. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's a neat resource for learning. Leak Code and Coding Game and all those support Rust as well. And, uh, you know, worth checking out. There's also a couple of places that I should mention that are just not programming language specific in any way. Instead of being multilingual, they're panlingual. Um, it's solve a problem. And the biggest of these, I think, are Project Euler, which if you haven't seen it, is a series of increasing difficulty mathematically oriented problems and is absolutely fantastic. And there's uh, Advent of Code. Advent of Code is an absolutely unique Christmas time experience. Uh, I don't know how to describe it except to say it's a series of th Christmas themed programming problems of increasing difficulty. Uh, I've seen a lot of people really learn Rust or at least up their Rust game dramatically by playing Advent of Code. And this is something I guess is worth saying about this, right, is that it's not just having a lot of learning resources, it's having a lot of learning resources that fit with what people need and want, a lot of learning resources that engage people, that connect with them, and so the fact that, you know, the advent of code is a silly Christmas-themed thing that a lot of people are doing together at the same time in a lot of different languages, it adds a thing that, you know, here's some more Rust-specific coding exercises just doesn't have. And I think we need to be creative in that space if we want to be successful. There's the forums. There's many, many Rust forums and resources where you can talk to people about Rust on the web, figure stuff out. Uh, Rust these days has a large Zulip chat forum, which is a bit of a fire hose, and I'm not sure it's the best place for new Rust users, but some people have used it successfully. Certainly it's a place where you can ask your why is the compiler doing this question and hope to get a pretty good answer. Uh, the other place to ask that, of course, is on GitHub. We're legendary for our uh, responsive, uh, well-curated uh, issue trackers and that kind of stuff, and we deserve that reputation. It's great. There's the Reddit group. Uh, I started Reddit about time Reddit started, left a few months ago over the latest big kerfluffle. I'll probably come back. Um, the Reddit Rust group is very well moderated. Um, the content t tends to be of high quality, except for the occasional person looking for the video game. <laughs> I can't see too much not to recommend there. There's, of course, Rust on Stack Overflow. Uh, I have such mixed feelings, like I think most people who are educators do about Stack Overflow. On one hand, so much wrong, bad, misinformed content. On the other hand, Sometimes the only place that even addresses your question in a way that's accessible. I guess 
I wouldn't point new REST learners at Stack Overflow, but they're gonna find it on their own in Google searches. And I guess what I would encourage them to do is what I would encourage anyone to do who's using Stack Overflow as a resource, which is to uh, be very quick critical of what you read. If you see code, try it out and test it first. If you, uh, if something seems confusing, talk to somebody about it and see if it makes sense. Uh, I think it can be used usefully. There's a ton for various Rust crates, various Rust projects, all of them have a ton of resources and some of those are really useful to new Rust users. If you're trying to start learning Rust, which is a thing by learning it in some category, learning it in the context of some uh, project, the Rust community is really good at that. They're really good at helping new users, and thank you all, people in this room, I'm talking to the choir here, the people in this room, thank you all for being that, being welcoming to people who are not only trying to figure out, I don't know, Bevy or Axum or whatever the project is, but also figure out how to use Rust at the same time. That's a really cool way to learn Rust. It's also a really hard way. And being support for that, super, super important. So many blogs. I started out to list the most important blogs and just kind of gave up because, holy heck, there's a lot of people writing about what they do. And so much of it is so good and so well written and so clear. Um, Faster Than Lime is its whole own thing. It's sad that Amos has had to step down for a while now, but going through that back content, there's a lot of articles that are not at all appropriate to a new Rust programmer. <laughs> I, I say not at all. They would be a struggle for a new Rust programmer, but there's also a lot of content that just isn't, that's just fine for somebody just starting in Rust. And the thing Amos is really good at is uh, explaining from the bottom up in such a way that you can carefully, if you're careful, you can follow all the steps to some very complicated Rust idea. And, you know, one of the things that's really interesting, really kind of cool, is that a lot of the folks on the Rust project, a lot of the leaders in this room blog, and again, thank you for that. The idea that you can go and read the day-to-day -day or at least week-to-week -week thoughts of the people who are actually developing the language and creating the language. For a new Rust station, that's super encouraging to be able to say, okay, these are people who, you know, maybe I don't understand everything they're saying, but I can understand some of it, and I can see that they're just being human beings. This isn't a faceless committee. It isn't one person in their basement. It's a group of people who are talking to each other and working together to build something cool. Probably the best resource for finding that kind of content, um, other than you know following the Reddit maybe, is uh, This Week in Rust. If you're not subscribed to This Week in Rust, you should be. It's a weekly newsletter that has a whole bunch of Rust-specific content that you really want. And one of the things is a list of great blog posts of the week that people have submitted. And it's a great way to find blogs that, you know, when I, when I read a, a blog post on This Week in Rust, the second thing I do is figure out whether I want to just subscribe to this person's blog. Um, it's, Rust is best learned with an RSS reader to some extent. There is, of course, YouTube. Uh, there's at rest videos, which I just found out about while preparing this talk. I did not know it existed, and it's kind of awesome. Uh, at rest videos is a official Rust YouTube channel linking uh, great content from the Rust community. It's the links that I looked at were to great talks. A lot of people really like learning through video today, and thankfully, there's lots of good options. A special shout out again to John Gainset for his Crust of Rust series, which is, again, just awesome intermediate to advanced Rust content. I've never met anyone who watched that series and wasn't 
happy to have done it. I suppose there is somebody, but I haven't met him yet. Um, I will say this. Uh, YouTube is what it is. I definitely, I won't call anybody out, but I definitely have found videos I can't recommend. If you're trying to pick out what to watch, um, I would encourage you to get some advice about specific videos and creators from people who know. Um, if you're one of those people who know, I'd encourage you to direct people who want to watch YouTube to good content um, because it isn't all accurate, it isn't all reasonable. There's, um, you know, we're attracting a community, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, here's a resource you probably nobody in the room has seen, but I hope you will. Uh, about a year ago, we ran the first Rust Edu workshop, which was a one-day online workshop where we, uh, collected papers, talks, um, position statements and stuff from a bunch of people who were engaged and are engaged or interested in Rust education. Uh, that was all archived. It's got, you know, an ISDN and everything or whatever it's called, a POI and everything. And, um, I would encourage you to check it out. There's some really, really cool Rust educational work. We need to hold another one of those soon. It's definitely, definitely on my plans to do that and to um, keep going with that. What have I left out? Oh, I've left out so much stuff. Um, the, I've left out conferences, for example. The, thank you to the GoSim folks for having a Rust track. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you to the Euro Rust people for really stepping up recently and delivering a really, really cool conference. Um, thank you to the RustConf folks who've been doing this almost since the beginning um, and every year provide an event people can go to. I think that's something that maybe isn't directly a Rust learning resource, but certainly helps encourage people to get started and helps people to learn. Uh, I could do this survey for another 20 minutes probably. I chose not to in the interest of time, but that hopefully at least gets some of the key categories and gives you some ideas of what to look at. One thing I should call out at this conference in particular is the natural language problem. Um, a lot of these don't have Chinese or other Asian translations. Uh, that's too bad. Some don't even have other Western languages than English. Um, it's would be really, we at Rust Edu really want to serve the whole world, not just the English speaking world. Please um, help us understand how we can help to make sure these Rust education resources are available to everybody. That would be great. So here's the, my claim, and I'll stand by this claim. I think it's a very, very defensible claim. If Rust is still hard to learn compared to other languages, um, compared to whatever languages of the past. The problem isn't that we don't have enough resources about how to learn. There's, we can still improve, we can still increase, there's still a lot of things we can do, but man, there's a lot out there to help solve that problem. I think Rust is the future. I don't think there's any question in my mind that you know, it's one of the languages I'll still be very happily practicing, you know, five years from now, which of course in technological years is forever. Um, and uh, and I, think, I think it has a very bright future. We're getting there as fast as we can, you know, and we struggle. This really is partly a pitch to help us out. Please go to rustedu.org, please join our Zulip, please help us figure out how we can develop not just educational resources, but build an educational community to uh, tackle the problem of teaching people Rust and helping them to learn it. Um, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I think that's what I've got today. Um, take questions or whatever.